The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your arms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So that, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth with moths and rusts consume, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Lord, uphold thou me that I might uplift thee. Amen. Many of my favorite books have something in common. When you open them, the first thing that you see on the inside cover is a map. This is a major clue about the sort of book you are about to read. When you find a map on the inside cover, even before you know anything about the characters or the plot, even before any of that, you know one thing, and that is that this story is going to move around. The story is going to require characters to move from place to place, and at times you're going to want to you know, keep one finger on the page where you're reading while flipping back to that map on the inside cover to check it and see how things relate to each other, right? And the story that's unfolding. Was the Emerald City northwest of Munchkinland or northeast? How far is the fire swamp from the cliffs of insanity? Whether you're reading Winnie the Pooh with a map of the Hundred Acre Wood or the Fellowship of the Rings with a map of the West of Middle Earth at the end of the Third Age or something else, whenever you open a book for the first time and see a map inside, it proclaims, adventure lies ahead. Now the map can't tell you the whole story. You do actually have to read the book. But it lays the groundwork and it serves as a reference point along the way to orient the reader to what is happening, what is coming. Now if Lent is a journey, then perhaps Ash Wednesday is a bit like a map you might find on the inside cover of the Jesus story. It is not the whole story of Jesus, but it does orient us and it provides clues for where we are headed. The most obvious clue being the symbol of the cross traced on our foreheads. 
Maybe it's no coincidence that the cross looks a lot like a compass. This year, more than ever, I cannot help but think of Lent as not just a season, but as a pilgrimage. Back in June, as many of you know, I took a group of 15 pilgrims to the Holy Land to make our journeys to the places in which Jesus lived and ministered and died and rose from death. And today, we are all setting out on a 40-day journey of spiritual preparation. And so with the images of Israel and Palestine still fresh in my memory from this summer, I am embracing Lent as a pilgrim this year, walking with Jesus to the cross. Now the theology of pilgrimage is not complicated. You set out on a spiritual journey and you trust that somewhere along the way, you'll gain some insight into why you are doing it. And along the way, the scenery changes. You will get disoriented. Your prayer life will likely get renewed. Your feet will get sore and your mind will get stretched. And you will encounter God at some point on the journey, but it is not always the place you thought it would be. Now, our Lenten pilgrimage begins today. And before we set out, we right here today have a chance to open the map and examine the path from where we are to where we are headed. And where are we headed? We impose these dusty ashes on our forehead to acknowledge exactly where we are headed, which is to say, to acknowledge our mortality, right? Now we may each conclude our earthly pilgrimage at different times, but ultimately, we are all headed to the same place. Now right now, around us, we cannot escape being reminded of mortality. With more than 100 Israeli hostages still not free, tens of thousands of innocent lives lost in Gaza, even if we had become numb to the staggering pain of it all, if we're paying attention even slightly, we can't pretend we aren't dust when so many of our fellow human beings have had their lives reduced to dust as we scroll on by. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. When we acknowledge our mortality, when we acknowledge our sinfulness, we dare to face the truth that to dust we all shall return. When we do this, what we're doing is explicitly owning up to the fact that we are not God, which is actually very good news because it means that God is God. So yes, we're mortal. Yes, we're sinful. But we have this pilgrimage and for the next six weeks or so, we will seek to grow closer to God, whom we are not, by giving up that illusion that we are God, right? And the Book of Common Prayer suggests some ways to do this. We'll hear them in a little bit. Prayer, fasting, reading scripture, outreach, service. When we do these things, we we create a situation in, where, in which we're a little less comfortable, right? A little less beholden to our cravings, a little more in tune with marginalized people, and maybe, maybe a bit more receptive to God's ways of speaking to us. In the midst of a world confronting daily terrors, our Lenten discipline can be a way of seeking to build the world that we crave. 
And through our prayers, our self-denials, acts of mercy, we can, you know, maybe cultivate a little compassion, some justice, and love. But while we're trying to remind ourselves that we are not and never will be God, God is trying desperately to show us that God has been one of us. If there's one thing I have learned in my pilgrimages, it is the power of the incarnation. The most incredible part of God becoming human is that we can't ever again say to God, you don't understand. You don't know how this feels. So we're on a Lenten pilgrimage. And to be pilgrims, we have to be willing to dive into the Gospels and follow everywhere where Jesus goes, right? His adventures took him all over, and we got to go with him. The beautiful places like the shore of Galilee, but also the dustiest, hardest places, the wilderness, the dungeon of Caiaphas's house, and ultimately to the foot of the cross. We got to go there. At times, it will be scary. At times, it will be beautiful. And towards the end, it will be excruciating. We will feel lost more often than not. But we have a map and a compass and a guide who promises us that the most painful chapter of the story is not the final ending of the story for him or for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.